Whenever we start talking about the optimality condition, the optimality principle, what we're really looking at is how do, how do, how do people make choices and how can they make better choices? And it's just sort of an economic fact of life. It's just reality that we have to choose between goods. At issue is how much do we have to expend on the choices that we make? In other words, what is the constraint that we face when we try to optimize our decision, when we try to maximize the well-being we get from the choices that we make? And that constraint that we face most frequently is something called the budget constraint or the budget line. Now, what we're going to look at here is a basic budget constraint where we have two goods, we'll call them uh, good X1 and good X2. So we're buying, we're spending all of our income on two potential goods. Now, sometimes people get hung up on this two goods, you know, really, who only buys two goods. But instead of thinking of it as two goods, maybe you want to think of it as two classes of goods. Think of this as your food and this is your clothing. Or think of this as um, all of the consumption goods that you uh, that you buy, and this is all the investment goods that you buy. So we can simplify or we can um, sort of uh, take those goods and put them into a into broad classification. So we don't have to just say, well, uh, you know, this is pencils and this is hamburgers or anything like that. So we can look at two groups of goods as well. And you spend your money on these two groups of goods. Now the budget line reflects how much money you have to spend. Okay, so we have our budget line, and it sort of gives us an outer limit as to what we can afford. So what is that line really telling us? Well, there's a lot of information contained in that line. So let's set up a mathematical equation for that line so we can get some of that information out, so we can get something that's gonna, going to be valuable for us. This line typically takes the form of this, P1 times X1. Let's make that a little bigger so we can make sure everybody sees it. P1 times X1. That's the price of good one times the amount of X1 that you buy. And we're going to add that to P2 X2, which is the price of good two times the amount of X2 that you buy. And that's going to be set equal to M, which just simply stands for our, uh, our budget or the amount of money that we have to spend. That's our typical equation. And you may look at that and you say, well, um, okay, that's fine. Really, what's the information there? It's just the price times the quantity plus the price times the quantity. Well, it's a little bit more than that. If we rewrite this line and we set one of these x values by itself on one side of the equal sign, we get a different look to this line. So let's do that. Let's leave P1x1 over here and take P2x2 and move it to the other side of the equal sign. And then if we one more time use a little bit of algebra here, and we're going to divide through everything by P1, that leaves us with X1 by itself on the left-hand side of the equal sign. These P1s cancel out. And that equals M over P1 minus P2 over P1 times X2. And you still may be saying, well, so what? What about that line? Well, that line, now rewritten in this form, is just the old-fashioned point-intercept slope of the line. M over P1, this gives us our intercept. And the slope of the line is P2 minus P1. This is our slope. You still might be saying, so what? But Actually, that is a really important thing, that slope. It's telling us that the relationship, as we change along this line, the relationship of that line, the relationship of the values of that line is determined by the prices of the goods that we're purchasing. As the price of one good goes up, the other price is going to go in the opposite direction. There's that negative sign. It's a negative slope. So we go down this line with a negative slope, and the prices are related to each other in such a way that those prices indicate to us, or they signal to us, 
the opportunity cost of our choice. It's the opportunity cost of our choice. As the price of a good goes up, it means we buy less of it. As the price of the other good goes down, relatively speaking, we buy more of it. And so that price indicates to us, or reflects to us, the opportunity cost. So if you're buying a good and you're not exactly sure how much of it you're going to buy, you look at the relative prices. And you can determine, how much do I have to give up if I'm going to buy good X, or X1? How much do I have to give up if I'm going to buy X2? How much do I get in return? That's all the, just the basic concept of the opportunity cost of choice, but now we have it in a little bit more mathematical format. Now, this budget line may change. It may move around a little bit. So let's take a look at what might go on here to this budget line as things change in the economy or things change in your circumstance. For example, let's say that this is the budget line, but then your boss comes to you tomorrow and says, hey, we're going to have to, we're gonna have to cut your pay or we're going to have to fire you. Those are your two options. You say, oh, I don't want to be fired, so I'll take the pay cut. I'm not real thrilled about that. Well, as your income goes down, basically M is falling, that's going to cause this budget line to shift. If your income falls, we're going to see that that budget line shifts inward parallel to the original. This red line represents a drop in income. The relative prices of the goods stay the same, so the slope stays the same. The intercept shifts down because M is dropping, but the line just moves parallel. And if your income increases, your boss comes to you and says, hey, you're doing a great job, we want to give you a pay raise, then we would see the line shift outward to the right, but parallel to the original. And the reason for that, the reason it's parallel, is because this slope doesn't change. Now, if the prices of the, if the relative prices of the goods change, then the shift in the budget constraint looks a little bit different. So let's get rid of this curve here. Let's say that the price of good 2, x2, goes up. So if p2 increases, your income doesn't change, but p2 goes up. Well, that changes the slope. It doesn't change the intercept. The intercept is still right here. But the slope of the line changes because this price is going up. As that price goes up, you can think about what's the outcome going to be in two different ways. If the price goes up, it means that the slope gets steeper. It also means that you're going to buy less of good two, of x2. So what happens? The budget line looks like this. It is anchored at that intercept, but it rotates to the left as the price goes up. So the result is that you buy less of x2 and the slope gets steeper. And of course, if the price were to fall, the result would happen. The opposite would happen, the opposite result. If the price of X2 falls, then you can buy more of it. The slope gets flatter, and so the curve would rotate this way. You'd be able to buy more of good X2. So when we look at the optimization condition, one of the first things we look at is the budget constraint. What's restraining you from getting more and more and more stuff? Well, it's your budget. 